So uh, let's take it verse by verse. Um, verse 16, Paul is being ironic, and he, he does this quite a bit. Uh, in fact, he uses this expression about ten times in First Corinthians. He says, know ye not, know ye not. What does it say in the NASB? Why does he put it there? Uh, do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? Now, why do you think he's doing that? I'll tell you why he's doing that, because the Corinthians think they know everything. That's why. They're arrogant. And they think that they're living in Corinth, and they know it all. And Paul, one of ten times, as we said, is saying, D don't you know? Don't you know? Which I thought was quite interesting that, you know, there is room for that kind of irony, maybe even satire, uh, in Scripture. So that's how he starts out. Well, don't you even know what? That ye are the temple of God. He uses the word ye. Um, in the King James, we know that's a, a, a plural pronoun, don't we? So he's talking about them. Um, as a congregation, as a church, mm. as, a, as a whole, you are the temple of God. And this, this is important because we have to differentiate here between <clears throat> what's the, called the local church and the church universal. Now the church universal is made up of all those believers throughout the globe, throughout the world. We're all united um, in one in Christ, aren't we? That's the church universal. But specifically here, Paul is using the plural pronoun, you, with reference, you notice in verse, again back to verse 16, with reference to a singular temple. Plural to a single temple. In other words, he's saying, look, you as the local church, as the local body of believers, not necessarily the whole universal church, but you in that vicinity, you are in that area, uh, the temple of God. We, we know that because then he says, if anyone uh, should destroy the temple, uh, God will destroy him. Well, you can't destroy the church universal, can you? The, gate, the gates of Hades won't prevail over the church, Jesus says. So he has to be talking about the local church. Now, why is that important? It's important because, basically, quite often when we come to verses about the temple, when we verses about um, the church general, we, we, we automatically seem to associate it with that invisible, worldwide, universal church. But actually, Paul is focusing, tonight here, he's focusing on our local body, the local church, the church that's in Corinth, or equally the church that's in Manchester, the church that's in Stockport, the church that's in Chorley, where Paul will be t tonight. So how important is that local church? Well, so much so that God says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, how is it that you could end up destroying the local church? How is it that, that could be um, undermined and ultimately ruined? Well, Paul's already talked about one of the problems that stuck and, and um, that he's mentioned it in chapter 1, and that is the problem of sectarianism. Of people saying, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Paul, I belong to Cephas, and, and, and so on. Um, and that same spirit can, can infect uh, the local church as well. People get bogged down. And I, um, not so long ago we had a sermon on that about getting... getting um, on a, a hobby horse about a particular doctrine, a particular issue, uh, and making it a matter of salvation, a matter of you. Well, you can only come in if you follow this particular doctrine or way. Uh, 
well that's divisive it can lead even to the church splitting apart dis destroying it but notice what the result of that is to the man or woman that does that the temple of God is holy which temple you are if you defile it him shall God destroy so it's a message really about how do we operate in the church as believers what sort of people are, are we do we recognize that uh, we're not actually on our own in the church but each of us is connected through Christ and how we treat one another um, is so important because if we're not treating each other uh, as Christ would then there's the very real danger that we are sowing dissension, sowing discord, and that will have an effect on us. Whether God might destroy us or God might, well, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5, this is what God sometimes does. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved. And do you recall the Corinthians um, were disagreeing so much and upsetting the church um, so unduly that uh, they were partaking it says of the of the bread and wine um, unworthily and the result of that was Paul says some of you have fallen asleep in death and some of you are very sick you know that's why <clears throat> and this is just another example of how God can discipline the believer doesn't mean that when we're sick when we're poorly God's disciplining us always but it is a good question nonetheless to ask ourselves if we are suffering with sickness if we're troubled with illness or some kind of problem in our life that we're not overcoming, that we're not getting to grips with, is there some kind of sin problem? Are we defiling the temple? Because we're not just defiling ourselves, are we? We're the temple of God. If you defile yourself, certainly you grieve the spirit, but also it has repercussions to the whole body, does it not? because you're one with your brothers and sisters in the church. You're bringing sin into the camp, so to speak. Remember uh, Achan, he did the same thing, didn't he? He brought sin into the camp of Israel. He was hiding stolen goods, and that led to malediction, it led to cursing upon Israel for a time until it was sorted, until it was found out. So it's so important not just to uh, look at oneself in terms of, well, I'm grieving the spirit, but also am I grieving the temple, the church? Is that the effect that my sin is having on the church? We don't think we're just alone, do we? We're, we're all part of a, a group, a unit. Um, and we're interconnected. So it says, um, in uh, verse, where is it? Here we go. Verse 18. Yeah, let no man deceive himself. Um, that could be a calling to what he's just written or to what he's about to write. But either way, let no man deceive himself. We know that uh, that, that is uh, the way we're made. Unfortunately, because of sin, we can deceive ourselves. 
says, If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So, the wisdom of the world. Is there a problem with the wisdom of the world, do you think? Is it such a, an issue? I mean, this is being recorded now by a device that's been invented and engineered and it allows people access to Bible study on, on, on the internet, another invention of man. How is it then that the wisdom of the world can be foolishness with God? Uh, we drove here tonight in a car, maybe you did as well. Cars are very useful. It might just mean that... Oh, sorry, go on, yeah. Sorry, yeah, it might just mean that, that this, the worldly wisdom is nothing compared to, to God's wisdom. Because this mm. is so much higher, so better than that, you know, maybe. Yeah? Yes. <clears throat> Particularly Paul is talking about, he's talking to the Corinthians now, and Corinth is a hotbed of philosophy, isn't it? It's that vain philosophy that people think will get you to God. But unfortunately, it doesn't. It's not the way of God that you can reach him by man's own way by being highbrow, for example, by being a, a smart aleck. If, if, you know, if some people are, aren't they? They can be very uh, arrogant with it. But rather, God ch chooses something rather <coughs> foolish in the, in the eyes of the world that, men, be, that man, men might be put to shame. Uh, and what is foolish? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, if ever you want to show people the gospel um, First Corinthians 15 first few verses moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand by which also ye are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless ye have believed in vain for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay, so if you're going to talk to some academic, some professorial type in a Red Brick University, and say to him, the essence of life, the whole point of our existence is a, a man who claimed to be God nailed to a tree. Now, what's he going to think of you? What's he going to, what's his view of you? He just thinks you're being foolish, you're just being stupid. How can that be of anything at all? But of course to us, quite the opposite. And what it does is it turns everything upside down. It turns everything on its head and says, God, who is so wise, of course he's eternally and infinitely wise, takes something um, so apparently rudimentary and it becomes the very essence of salvation, what it is to be truly alive by simply having faith in a man who died upon a tree. It's an amazing message. But the question is, have we come to that point where we recognize that, you know, we have to be foolish, that this is the interesting thing about the tense here, that Paul is saying we, we need to be foolish. It's not just that it is foolish, 
but that we have to be foolish. And often it's the it's the experience of a person who has uh, had it all, been arrogant, but then loses everything and is in despair and is ground down and is whose soul is dis disquieted and feels that they're nothing, that they're worthless. It's only then really that they grasp, isn't it, the cross and see it for what it is, have the wisdom of God, the salvation in the cross, in the cross. Now, the, the, I suppose the point here is that if Paul is saying to us, we, we might have been like that back when uh, we were saved, but has that continued? Or do we steadily go back to the way we are? Are ye yet carnal? This is what we've been looking at over the past few weeks with uh, Paul. Uh, you, once you come to Christ, you've got these two options now. Are you going to be carnal? Are you going to go back to being a fleshly uh, Christian, so-called? Or are you going to be a spiritual Christian, that is one who sows uh, to the Spirit, sows to righteousness? And it's very easy. You can see how uh, people can get led along in, into that uh, arrogance. Particularly, um, have you, why is it that when people have to come into Christ, they feel the need to go to Bible college, don't they? Well, it's necessarily Bible college is a bad thing. But then, the, you know, and they'll do so many degrees, then they'll have a, an MA in theology and a BA in theology and maybe a PhD and, and what have you. Um, and it can go to the head, can't it? It can be a problem. It can be um, a replacement for what should be our day-to-day -day experience of walking with Christ and Christ being in us. Because that's the essence of it, is it not? You know, Jesus in us. And you can't really describe that. You can't really uh, convey that to somebody. You either, you've either got it at the moment or you haven't. We know when Jesus is in us. We know what it feels like. It's out of this world. Not because it is. But when we haven't got it, well, this is where we need to question where, where, where are we? Are we in the spirit? What are we, what are we doing? in our Christian life, our Christian walk? Is there, is there any sin that's getting in the way, any pride? Um, are we polluting the temple of God? And of course the wonderful thing is that when we are doing it right, the, the, the tremendous feeling of joy and satisfaction, it's incredible. We, you, know, you know what it is like to have that blessing of God and to be translated into a higher plane of existence. Why? Because God's living in you. And all the cares of the world and all the worries and so forth, whatever might be going on, um, it's not really a problem, is it? You still have managed to have your joy because you're in the eye of the storm. You're in a safe place uh, where God is blessing you. And all about you can be uh, disturbing and disruptive, but... If Jesus is in you, you know, he that is in you, yes, is greater than he that is in the world. So, um, yes, the wisdom of the world is foolish with God. Um, uh, Paul quotes from uh, Job 5 verse 13. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Yes, so you see people... They can be very wise in a worldly sense, but my, how they can be broken down and taken in a moment. Is that not so? I remember reading, is it John Paul Getty? He said he'd give all his money if he could just have one decent meal because he had a terrible um, stomach problem. He said his life, it was the bane to his life. His life was so... Um, uh, he was just so morose all the time because he could, you know, one of those joys that we have of, for example, in every day thing we take for granted, of eating, he couldn't, he couldn't enjoy it. And yet he had all the money in the world. See, God can take it from you. You can go in but a moment. God is sovereign. Uh, verse 20, 
and again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise uh, that they are vain we go on therefore let no man glory in men for all things are yours now any idea why Paul would say uh, for all things are yours well uh, what about Matthew chapter 5 And verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And verse uh, 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we're due to inherit what? the new heavens and the new earth. Now, do we really believe that? I don't know anybody here has ever had a vision like that, a vision of the new heavens and the new earth. Some people do have, have that, I've have heard of people. But that's, that's what's to come, isn't it? We're heirs. And if you read in, in uh, Romans 8, We'll be joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with the Son of God and also God himself. That's incredible, isn't it? It's absolutely incredible that we'll have dominion over this earth. We'll have access to God. We'll be able to, in glorified bodies, enjoy both the heavens and the earth. Now how does that compare with maybe the TV dinner you had tonight? Or the, <laughs> maybe I don't know, we didn't, we, we had uh, salad. Um, <laughs> um, or, you know, the general day-to-day -day stuff that can get you down. Well, just remember that our life is but a what's the expression um, a blade of grass yes blade of grass and it withers and goes like that you see but that is in comparison to eternity which is endless isn't it I mean if you, if you could if you could go to say somewhere like the British Library and see all the books great sea of books from end to end go round them and round them and round them and just take one book out that would be your life on this earth but when you look up all the other books don't even begin in terms of eternity to represent what we will experience in terms of time when we uh, when we get to heaven and earth <laughs> because of course there's, there's both the new heavens and the new earth so <coughs> it's about having that hope isn't it and uh, not getting too bogged down to every with everyday existence I know I've not found that easy because uh, you know, with either uni or with, uh, you know, job applications and all of that, it, it gets in the way. It really does. Um, and maybe you find that too, just the everyday grind. <laughs> okay, so all things are yours. Now, verse 22, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, 
and Christ is God's. Yes, so all things are ours, but there's a reason why that is, and that's because we're in Christ, and Christ is in God. Our lives are hidden in Christ, in God, uh, Paul also says elsewhere. So we don't get a bit too uppity and think, oh, we're going to inherit uh, this you know, wonderful eternal future. And we've got to remember that this is, this is only inherited because Christ has done it for us. Uh, he's, uh, he's made the way. Um, but what is so powerful about this is that we have been bought with a Christ, was with a price, sorry, <coughs> with the blood of Christ and so there is an assurance then because at times that's some, another issue that we can have uh, assurance are we saved uh, maybe we've not had any particular um, um, movement of Holy Spirit in a significant way in our lives things like that can happen can't it I mean if, if you were to take a straw poll, the average Christian will tell you, you know, at the beginning it was, it was uh, fireworks. <laughs> and then farther along it seems to be that God wants you to step out in faith and not necessarily in experience and having all the emotion that comes with it. Not always the case. But don't let that make you feel, oh, Maybe I'm not saved anymore. I don't feel assured. God's not with me. He's not showing his face. Because remember what happened at salvation. You are Christ's. You are Christ's, yes? And Christ is God's. Well, goodness me. If you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God, I mean, it's going to be a bit difficult, isn't it, um, to get yourself out of that once you've been bought with that price. Now, I know there are various views about uh, whether you're a, a, a salvation is eternal or not. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a security in remembering that you are Christ's. And if God is willing to send his own son, who is also God, his own son to die... And for you to have that salvation experience, and for God to have gone through that, indeed, even if you were the only person, yes? If you were the only person on earth who would have come to him, do you think that he's going to let you go? Just like that. Do you think he's going to, you know, if you've backslidden, or you, you, know, you have a problem with sin, or whatever issue, do you think he's going to just say, you know, I'll let you go there with ease. Of course he isn't. Not if you're prepared to send your own son to die in your stead. Of course not. It's a terrific thing. And I think we have to remember that the terrific uh, mercy of God. We were under the wrath of God, yes. But we're also under his mercy. We're under his grace now. Yeah? And God remembers that there is still within us, Galatians 5, you only have to read it, sin, the sin problem, the flesh, that every day is trying its best to pull us back, pull us out. But, Paul says, not to give in to the accuser. He says, go boldly, go boldly into the most holy. Why? Because Christ's done it. The accuser of the brothers, he has no accusation. Because if you're relying on Christ, then, and you're repentant, then you can go. You can go into the, in the... I mean, how else could you do it? You couldn't do it anyway, in your own scheme, could you? It doesn't mean that we ac uh, accept that grace as a, an excuse for licentiousness, Paul says. Uh, but equally, we have to, we have, just have to be careful that we get, we don't become, um, we condemn ourselves and forget that God is greater than our hearts. And Psalm 103, is it 103? Yes, that he remembers that we're dust. He remembers that we're dust. The sin problem is with us. 
we've got to fight it, we've got to be holy. But remember, there is propitiation. There is room for forgiveness and mercy. <coughs> and uh, God's shown it by sacrificing his one and only son. And just interesting, as a final point, uh, I thought that this is a good example of the, the, the hierarchy of God, of the Godhead. Uh, sometimes you get the cultists who will say, you see, you're Christ and Christ is God's. So how can Christ be God if Christ is God's? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, well, obviously we're talking about the Father here, the Father God. And Christ is God's in the sense that he recognises the headship of the Father. Within the Godhead, there is headship. You've got the Father, followed by the Son, and followed by the Holy Spirit. We tend to pray first and pull the glory to the Father. That actually is a scriptural the way. Uh, you can pray to Jesus, of course, but um, if you want to get the apologists on it, they're quite interesting. Uh, or, you know, uh, they'll say, well, strictly speaking, Father, uh, Son, and pray to the Holy Spirit, I'm not so sure about really. <laughs> uh, he is the quieter member of the, of the, uh, the Godhead, is he not? Um, and uh, Paul makes the distinction in, the, in, the, in his letters between the Father and Christ, calling the Father God and calling Christ Lord. But as we know, Lord... Uh, in back in, in those days, was a reference to deity, was a reference to to God Himself. So uh, it's amazing that even in the Trinity, there's that family arrangement, <laughs> you know, and there's the, there's a, a functional, as they call it, subordination. Uh, posh word is ontology. So in, in terms of being ontologically, they're equal. You know, they are God, but in function. Christ defers to his father. It's amazing. And he'll hand back the kingdom, won't he? Says, and, then, and then we will be subject and God will be in all. And we look forward to that very much indeed. Okay, so um, I think we finished there.